and good morning to those in the UK. My name is Parida Limbong on behalf of the British Council Indonesia Foundation and the Association for the Teaching of English Language as a Foreign Language in Indonesia or TEFLIN. I would like to welcome you to the third national symposium on English language assessment. Before we begin, I would like to share the house rules for the symposium. The British Council will record the whole webinar session. By attending this session, you acknowledge that your image and comments may be recorded and rebroadcasted. The attendees can join the session via Zoom and YouTube. Please type your questions in the chat box on YouTube and Zoom, and we will then summarize and deliver the questions to the presenters. At the end of the session, you will be given a link to complete evaluation survey. We encourage all attendees to complete the survey that will help us design future webinars and events for you. The link to download e-certificate and materials will be provided after you complete your survey and it will be available until 7 p.m. Jakarta time today. A very warm welcome to Mr. Colum Downs, the Director of Education, English and Society at the British Council Indonesia, Professor Joko Nurkanto, the President of TEFLIN, and to our three presenters today, Dr. Jamie Dunley, Ms. Cecilia Setiawati Halimi, PhD, and Dr. Willie Renandia. This year is the third year we are organizing the National Symposium on English Language Assessment and also our second collaboration with TEFLIN. Over 4,400 people from eight countries registered for the first session. We also have attendees from Papua, the easternmost province of Indonesia, to Aceh, the westernmost province. The symposium will consist of four online sessions, which will be conducted every Thursday from the 1st of October until the 22nd of October at 1.30 p.m. Jakarta time. And the, the theme for this year is Language Assessment 2020 and Beyond. Today, we'll explore the importance of English language assessment standards and frameworks and the current practice in Indonesia. Moving on, I would like to invite Professor Joko Nurkanto to deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome Professor Joko Nurkanto. Professor Joko, I think you're still on mute. Right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable Director of British Council Indonesia, Bapak Ormdon, distinguished speakers, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. On behalf of the National Executive Board of Teflin, I would like to welcome you all to the third National Symposium of English Language Assessment, 2000 to 2020, organized by the British Council Indonesia Foundation in collaboration with TEFLIN. The theme of this symposium is looking to the future, language assessment 2020 and beyond. I think the choice of the theme is quite appropriate, bearing in mind that the Indonesian government has not yet officially adopted assessment standard, especially for English language assessment, such as common European framework of reference. One of the consequences of this is that educational institutions, such as universities and language centers, develop their own assessment tools with different standards. Therefore, the scores vary and do not reflect the real competence of test takers. In addition, 
the use of technology and assessment also requires special attention because this may become a trend in the future. The phenomenon of the COVID pandemic can be taking place, forcing us to work using technology. And this is making us more aware of the importance of the use of technology and language education, in particular in the field of language assessment and how important it is for us to possess digital literacy. I feel sure that all speakers will be able to elaborate well on the above themes. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for their willingness to share their expertise. They include Dr. Jimmy Denley, Professor Fuad Abdul Hamid, PhD, Professor Swartih Matia, PhD, Dr. Willy Renandia, Cecilia Stiawati Halimi, PhD, Richard Spivey, Caroline Westbrook, Chris Redmond, Dr. Sinta Tresna Devi, Harumi Malik Ayu Yamin Mhum, Yudin Ferbarin, Robin Skipsey, Sheryl Cook, Trevor Brickspear, Dr. Nur Arif Bahdrajati, MBD, Dr. Gunab Kumawang Jati, and William Delis. I would like also to offer a special word of thanks to the Director of British Council Indonesia, Bapak Kolmdun, for working together with TEFLIN, especially in the organizations of various academic activities, such as seminars, conferences, and symposiums. Last but not least, allow me to express my highest appreciation to all the participants who are taking part in this online symposium. I hope you all enjoy the symposium. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bapak. Bapak, I think your camera is still off. Can you please uh, turn on your camera so all attendees can see you? Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Joko Nurkamto. So um, I would like to invite Mr. Kong Downs to deliver his opening remarks and to officially open the third national symposium on English language assessment. Please welcome Mr. Kong Downs. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Salamat siang, Bapak and Ibu. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the president of Teflin, uh, Bapak Joko Nokamto, for your uh, generous opening remarks. I'm delighted that you at home have all decided to join our webinar today. So my name is Colm Downs, and I'm the British Council Director for English Education and Society here in Indonesia, and I'm currently at home, like many of you, working from Jakarta. Um, I want to say a, a little bit about this webinar series and about language assessment um, and this, you know, before we begin. But before I do that, I wanted to recognize the challenges that all of you uh, teachers and English language professionals are facing at the moment here in Indonesia and around the world. It's a very difficult time to be an, an educator and a teacher. Schools and universities are closed uh, and you are working from home. You are having to develop new skills and techniques in order to continue the education of your students. Um, and these are skills that are uh, challenging um, and it's uh, something that all of, all of us are having to develop at you know, quite a rapid speed. And uh, in addition to that, I know that many of you are parents and you have students at home that you often maybe have to supervise during their online lessons. So there are multiple challenges at the moment. So really, I wanted to thank you for your efforts, and your creativity, and also your commitment to continuous professional development. Um, the fact that you've joined our webinar today um, is an example of that. So really, um, it's very, very admirable um, you have a lot of respect from me for you know, managing this situation and, and making every effort to continue the education of your students and to learn new techniques and skills through joining um, opportunities such as this. 
I'm very pleased and proud that we are working in collaboration with Teflin on this webinar series. Uh, Teflin is an extremely strong national teachers association. I've been lucky enough to go to a number of excellent conferences with Teflin um, in different parts of Indonesia. But through this online approach, one of the benefits is that we are now able to reach uh, English language teachers in all parts of the country. Uh, and you no longer have to travel uh, to a city or a hotel to attend an event and to, to, to get some insight from our expert speakers. Some of our expert speakers are joining us from around the world. And this morning we have Jamie Dunlier um, from the UK. I think it's only just gone seven o'clock in the morning. So we're very pleased that Jamie is with us. Clearly on language assessment, I, part of my job is to help support the development of English teaching and learning um, in education systems around the world. And currently I'm doing that here in Indonesia. And I think I would just emphasize those two words. It's teaching and learning. And a lot of the time we focus a lot on our teaching practice, our pedagogy, um, but maybe not enough time is spent on the learning, what students are learning and how much they have learned. Um, and part of your job as a teacher is to fairly test and assess your students' um, progress, their level of English, so that you can give them good feedback and direct them um, and give them, you know, so that they clearly have a, a good understanding of what their current level of English is, where their strengths are, and where they need to, to work harder to improve. And throughout this series of four webinars throughout the month of October, we're going to be looking at both formative assessment, assessment for learning, and summative assessment. This is the kind of assessment that most teachers are familiar with, the tests at the end of the course or the end of the semester. Um, often, and myself included, when I trained to become a teacher, there was a lot of focus on um, classroom methodology, but I, I didn't have very much training in assessment techniques. And I think all teachers can benefit from further reflection and training about the importance of assessment in English language teaching. And throughout this series of talks and workshops, I'm, I'm confident that you are going to develop your own skills, reflect on your own practice, and become much more knowledgeable about um, how to conduct assessment effectively with your learners. I, I'll, well, I wanted to talk about really and give you some some phrases or expressions to take away with you from myself this morning. One is what is called, I think, the, the Fs of assessment. This is a term that was, uh, I heard recently from a, an expert in the UK called Dave Allen at Nile. And he talks about the Fs of assessment, that assessment should be fair, formative, and also that assessment can help give your students both feedback on what they've learned uh, and give you feedback on your teaching, but also it can feed forward because based on um, your fair tests, you're able to give concrete advice and recommendations to your, your students. And the second phrase or expression that I picked up from Dave was that he said the three M's or the three M principle of language assessment that marks, make your marks meaningful. Um, often with English language tests, I've seen this in Indonesia, um, you might be giving your students 70 out of 100 or 80 out of 100, but, but what does that mean? Um, what criteria are you using to make that assessment? If you are telling your students that they're, let's say they're good at speaking, what makes them good at speaking? Is it that their pronunciation skills are good? or that they're able to keep speaking, that they're very fluent, or perhaps it's that they have a wide range of vocabulary. Maybe it's because they have, a, you know, a, in addition to a wide range of vocabulary, they can use a variety of different grammatical structures and use those accurately. So when, whether you're assessing your students' spoken English, written, listening, you know, whatever, um, 
skill you are assessing, you need to be using a criteria in order to, to make that assessment meaningful and to be able to give clear, constructive feedback to your students. And this is an area that we're going to be exploring today in a little bit more detail. As Farida has said, we've got four webinars. Today, we've, we're going to start off with Jamie from the UK, who's going to be talking a little bit more about how a well-developed, well, how well-developed proficiency frameworks and standards such as the Common European Framework can help drive forward education systems. And then we will have uh, Cecilia, who will talk a little bit about the current practice of English language assessment in schools and universities here in Indonesia. And then finally, I'm delighted the, that today we have um, Professor Willy Renandia, who is going to be talking in more detail about the importance of your own English proficiency levels and standards. It's very important that uh, we all continue to improve our language skills, just as I need to improve my Indonesian. Um, I, you will all, I think, benefit from improving your, your English language skills so that you, you are always stronger than your best students. Later in this webinar series, uh, we will be exploring the future directions. The, the theme of this conference is language assessment both now in 2020, but also what lies ahead in the future. So we will be talking about the impact of technology and artificial intelligence. Increasingly, um, AI is being used to assess learning across the skills um, and technology is coming into the classroom and both out of the classroom. Right now you are using uh, your phone or your laptop to join this webinar and you're also using these tools to keep in touch with your students. These tools are going to be useful in assessment too um, in the future. So in the last webinar of this series, um, I'm very pleased that we have the president of another great teachers association in Indonesia, Pat Gumawang Jati and Fenita um, from ITEL, who are going to be talking about uh, remote assessment. Uh, which is uh, much needed right now during this pandemic. So thank you very much for joining this webinar series. The webinars are being recorded, um, so please share them with fellow teachers. You are really the, the best teachers in Indonesia that are committed to professional development, and that's uh, demonstrated by your attendance today. Uh, there are many other teachers who will also benefit from these uh, talks, so please encourage your your fellow teachers in your school or your area to watch these recordings or perhaps to register for the, the remaining webinars in this series. Um, I, we welcome your feedback um, and whether you're watching this webinar on YouTube or you're here with us in the Zoom, um, the experience is the same and we will be monitoring the chat and the questions from both channels. Um, so think of some great questions as you listen to the next three speakers, and uh, we'll have a, a, a nice amount of time at the end of this, this webinar today to have a discussion and put your questions to our panelists. So that's really all from me. Take care, um, stay safe. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and I, I hope you enjoy this afternoon's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cole Downs. Um, so our first speaker, Dr. Jamie Dunley, Senior Researcher and Manager of Assessment Research Group at British Council in the UK. He joined the British Council in 2013 and has over 25 years of experience working in EFL education, test development and production and assessment research. He works on a range of language test development and validation projects and has advised ministries of education and national agencies on assessment reform, uh, reform projects, such as linking UK examinations to the China's standard of English. His presentation will explore how standards and frameworks drive the education system and improvement of language skills. Please welcome Dr. Jamie Dunley. Hey, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now I'll just share my screen and get my presentation up. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, first of all, let me say that I'm very happy to be here and to join you this afternoon. I was uh, lucky enough to be, very lucky to be invited to the 66th Teflon Conference in Medan last year, which I found to be uh, an extremely exciting, vibrant conference uh, that uh, showed me the enthusiasm of the teachers uh, in your association and, and across Indonesia, I think. So I'm really happy to be back today and to share our ideas again today. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today, how standards and frameworks can drive the education system. Uh, it, they can, but there can also be issues involved with them as well. So I'm going to talk about some broad ideas today that I hope we can have a discussion about later in the q and I'm going to be giving examples, but I, I don't want people to think that this is meant to be the only examples or the only way that I'm uh, suggesting. These are ideas, and obviously there are going to be other ways of doing it. So these are something that I think are important. Uh, concepts, they're important uh, guidelines for helping to make the best use of standards and frameworks. And there's also some warnings about what we might want to avoid. But once again, this is not meant to be the only way to do it. These are ideas that I'd like to share with you today. So moving on, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the role of standards in uh, education systems. So more and more, uh, oh, before I start that, I might just go back and say uh, I was introduced there and my role is generally within assessment. My expertise is within assessment. Many, many years ago, I was always a, well, also a language teacher in the classroom in Japan. But uh, my field of expertise is assessment. But more and more within the British Council, um, we are looking at, and within our own assessment research group, which I belong to within the British Council, which specializes in testing, we are looking at how we can integrate assessment better into the education system. Uh, and what we're describing the education system as, is as a comprehensive learning system. So what does a comprehensive learning system look like? Uh, and this is a diagram that's been adapted and taken from uh, the head of the assessment research group, Barry O'Sullivan, a paper that he's producing on this concept and that we hope to share more widely in the near future as well. So what does the education system look like? So we, we can think of three critical parts. Once again, these are not the only parts. There are other ways you could look at the system, but this is one way of thinking about three critical parts of the education system. And we have a triangle which includes the curriculum. We have the delivery of the curriculum at the bottom left-hand corner. And the delivery, what we're talking about there is what happens actually in the classroom, the interaction between the teachers and the students. And that is mediated by the textbooks. It's mediated by the teachers. So we need teacher training. It's mediated by things like classroom design and the, the actual technology that's available, the facilities that are available. And then on the right hand side, we have assessment. And we've already heard the, the words formative assessment. And of course, summative assessment. Assessment is not one size fits all. There are various ways and uses uh, that we can make of assessment within the system. Now, the important thing about this triangle is to demonstrate that the three critical parts of this system need to be connected. They don't stand alone. And very often uh, we will see parts of these systems not being connected together. So the assessment might not reflect what's in the curriculum. The curriculum may look fantastic, but actually teachers are not given the training to be able to deliver that curriculum in a, in a meaningful way. And particularly, this is something we've seen with the ideas around communicative language teaching and communicative language testing. Great ideas that often aren't supported by the right teacher training to help teachers be able to deliver those ideas in the classroom. So we need to make sure that our system is connected. Now, this is a, a system in when we're talking about this, we could be talking about the system from a national perspective. So this might reflect something that happens at a national level. It may reflect something that happens at a state or provincial level, depending on the, the national system you're in. It's also relevant, and the ideas I'm going to talk about further, I think are relevant within an institution. Even within an institution, 
these three parts of the system exist as a microcosm, we'll still have the curriculum, we'll have the delivery of the curriculum and we'll have assessment. Now, how much control people have over those parts will of course, to some degree be different. At the national level, there's much more control over the curriculum, for instance, and potentially the kinds of assessment, particularly at a very high stakes level that are delivered. But there may be less direct control over how that's actually delivered in the classroom. Uh, so the parts of this system can actually be reflected at different levels of our education system. So where do standards fit? Well, standards fit right in the middle. So we've got a comprehensive learning system. It should integrate the curriculum, the delivery and assessment. Assessment needs to be a critical part, but not the main part of the system. And the standards sit right in the middle. So the standards will drive all parts of this system. So the standards need to be integrated into everything, but they may be used in different ways. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on, that the way we might actually manipulate or utilize the standards within the delivery or within the assessment may look slightly different depending on what our goals are, okay? But we have the standards driving the actual uh, system right from the center. So what are standards? Well, let's have a look at some uh, one, one kind of standard, the CFR, the Common European Framework of Reference. Uh, now this is a, a framework, not a standard in that it wasn't designed to be implemented in a way that was written in stone. It was designed to be adapted by different contexts as appropriate. So the authors of the, of the system have called it a framework rather than standards. But once it's adopted, particularly from a Ministry of Education perspective, and it is the goal or it drives the curriculum, it does become the standards, the standards that we aim for, the standards that we measure uh, achievement and progress by. So the Common European Framework was published in 2001, but I think it's important to see that that drew on 40 years of research and language education in Europe. So it drew on a wide body of research and that 40 years of language education in Europe also was shared and drew on experiences around the world as well. Now, something that's also very important to recognize with the system is that they change and they need to adapt and be flexible. And the Common European Framework of Reference has seen a very recent update, the, what's called the companion volume, which has introduced very interesting concepts in more detail. Uh, for example, mediation um, and pluricultural competence into the framework. And that was introduced in 2018 and more recently published in a more formal context in 2020. So I think one of the important takeaways here is that when we set our standards, we need to be aware that they have to change. We shouldn't write things in concrete and expect that there is no flexibility. Any system needs to be constantly monitoring and evaluating. The CFR was designed to do that. And actually we should expect change, that we should learn from the experience and we should expect to be able to adapt things as we go. So what is the CFR? Now, the CFR is a comprehensive document, the companion volume, a comprehensive document, but at its heart, we can say that an important feature is the level system, the proficiency level system. In this Common European Framework of Reference, the names of the levels are sometimes a little bit confusing, but if we see the six broad steps on the left there, we start at A1 at the beginning level, uh, and we move through the system, the B1 in the intermediate level to B2, we're getting into an advanced level of proficiency, uh, for example, suitable for university entrance in an English medium instruction context. And then we get into very high levels of proficiency at C1. Now, once again, I'm offering the CFR as an example, not the only example. There can be many other ways of doing standards for language proficiency, and there can be many other ways of adapting even the CFR. But the CFR is a good example, I believe, and it's also an example which has had a great deal of influence around the world and in Indonesia as well. So it is worth discussing uh, this as our example of how to implement. So what are the features of a good set of standards? Well, the idea is that we do have a description of the proficiency that's expected at each level. It allows us to visualize and to see what we expect learners to be able to do in different areas. So we have a qualitative element which gives us the ability to describe the proficiency. Then we have a quantitative element which gives us the ability to measure. So the proficiency at B1 
should be measurably different from proficiency at A2 and should show us measurably the distinction between proficiency at a higher level at B2. So a good well-designed set of standards will have a quantitative and a qualitative perspective and the CFR does indeed contain both of those perspectives. Now, the CFR I think is a very useful uh, instrument and tool, but I think when we're implementing standards, there are lessons that we should be learning that are very important. And there are things that we should avoid and there are problems. Standards can drive an education system, but implemented badly, they can drive it in the wrong way. And we want to learn the lessons of the implementation of the CFR, and we want to be able to avoid those issues where possible. So this is some findings from a survey that was carried out in 2013. So that's basically 12 years after the CFR was implemented in Europe in 2001. And it looks at how it's been implemented and some of the issues that may have arisen with its implementation across Europe. And so some of the issues are, one of the key conclusions was that major challenges in the implementation concerned, firstly, the lack of empirical evidence to links between learning outcomes and the CFR levels. And secondly, the ability of teachers to use the CFR in their lessons as intended. So does that sound familiar? In fact, in many countries around the world, I have encountered these issues with implementation of the CFR. And quite often it's viewed as a criticism of the CFR is not appropriate for our context. In actual fact, issues of implementation occur even within Europe which is where the CFR arose. Another key conclusion was that a majority of the selected countries surveyed implemented the CFR in tests and examinations. However, the links between learning outcomes to CFR levels lack general empirical evidence. Now, this is another key issue that's arisen around the world. And this is that the CFR can be used too simplistically as an assessment tool. Now, to the uh, benefit of the assessment community to which I belong, a lot of very good work has gone into how we actually make sure that our examinations are fair, as uh, Colin was mentioning this morning, one of the key features, but that also provide relevant feedback. We can align those exams in an empirical, evidence-based way. Not so much work has been done in other areas to ensure that curriculum and materials have evidence to say, why is this B2? What does this mean? The meaningful concept that Colm also mentioned this morning. That's what the standard should be able to give us, the meaningfulness of what we are actually measuring. But we have to have evidence to link those parts of the uh, education system back to our standards. So another key feature that was found was that whether teachers know about the CFR depends on the emphasis placed on the CFR in curriculum, and in teacher training. So very often the curriculum can be divorced from the CFR and teacher training doesn't take the CFR into account. Now, this is another issue that I've encountered in many countries around the world, but actually we can see it's also an issue in Europe where the CFR arose. So if we don't have those connections between the different parts of the system, the curriculum, the teachers and the assessment and the standards, we're not going to be able to make best use of what is potentially a very good tool. And so this is a report that's available online. It's a little bit out of date now, of course, but it's a useful, uh, I think, example of implementation and, and lessons that we can learn in the implementation of standards and what we might want to avoid. Uh, okay, so, but the general outlook was very positive. And as I am too, the CFR is seen as a very positive tool. It's taken us forward much further than we could have before. I started using the CFR not in Europe, but in Japan, where it proved to be a very useful tool for helping us conceptualize uh, our proficiency levels to help us talk to people across contexts, whether those contexts were different schools, different uh, parts of Japan or different countries to have a common language to describe proficiency. And that was a very powerful development that the CFR and well-designed standards can offer. So the general perspective is that it's a positive development, but there are issues. Now let's look at actual levels. We often look at the implementation of the CFR. One of the questions that arises is, yes, but that was Europe and proficiency in Europe is much different to here in Japan or here in Indonesia. 
and Europeans have a lot more exposure to using English as a second language, so we can't expect that we should have the same set of standards. Well, this is a survey that was carried out once again in 2013, uh, 2011 actually, sorry. I think it was published in 2012. Um, it was a European language competence survey, the only really major full cross-European survey of proficiency in high school students, second year of high school, across Europe. This is the found findings from uh, reading. Now the survey had its limitations. What I'm showing you this result for is really just to show you the diversity across Europe in the proficiency levels achieved. The, the countries are at the bottom, we don't need to worry about which country is which, and the proficiency levels you can see are on the side. So uh, the light blue stripes there at the bottom, pre-A1, below A1, going through to B2. And what we can see here is a huge range of diversity. Within Europe, there is actual, a huge amount of diversity in terms of proficiency levels, education systems, and some of those proficiency levels are very, very low. We'll see high school students in reading being below A1, okay? And this is something that I often, once again, hear in many countries as a criticism of adopting standards like the CFR to say, well, our proficiency levels are different. So actually, no, there are many contexts which share those same challenges. Now, the opportunity for us is to see how we can share some of the same solutions to those challenges across contexts, okay? So it's just trying to emphasize that often when you think about your proficiency levels in different contexts being too low, which is a criticism I often hear, that you're not alone. It's not a unique challenge and that these are some of the issues I'll summarize at the end of, of the talk. So another issue that comes up is the idea of an international standard like the CFR is how far can we stretch common or international standards? Now, I would suggest that actually this is something which is relevant uh, not just to the international, but within a diverse uh, country such as Indonesia, it can be often even a discussion about how far can we stretch common standards across one incredibly diverse uh, country with cultures and languages and regions. It's often posed, particularly in terms of a test, so we might have large scale international tests like IELTS, for example, and we may have locally developed tests for education systems. And there's often a tension, or it's seen as a tension between tests that are seen to be globally neutral and useful anywhere in the world, and tests that no, need to be locally appropriate. And they're seen as it's an either or choice. And I, I don't think it is an either or choice. It's more like a continuum, locally appropriate and globally neutral. It's more about the balance and where we, we need to put those, that test or standards on that continuum. It's not an either or, yes or no, black or white choice. What, what we see is that the CFR is actually, when used properly, adapted, not adopted. So the CFRJ is a good example of that in Japan, which developed extra descriptors to help it be implemented in the local context and to take, uh, take awareness of the local context into the CFR. But the bulk of the actual framework remains the same. It's being adapted to the local context. And it's not done in an ad hoc way, it's done in a principled way, which once again is driven by evidence. And in fact, we go back to Europe and we see that in many countries within Europe, the very useful resources to look at the European language portfolios, which are collections of locally adapted versions of the CFR to help drive education systems. So one size fits all, the CFR unchangeable is not the right way to implement it in an education system. A little bit more, because uh, I'll run out of time in a minute, a little bit more about what this locally appropriate and globally neutral uh, dichotomy might look like. And I don't, once again, think it's a dichotomy. It's more about how we might find the right balance for each situation. And each situation may be different. It's not the case that because we're in Indonesia, everything needs to be locally appropriate and we shouldn't think about the global. And once again, this could be reflecting not just the international versus local, it could be the national versus very local in terms of what is the right balance. Now, there are different elements of the system. We've got our standards, we've got our vocabulary, we've got topics and situations, we've got pronunciation. These are just some aspects that need to be thought of, not just in tests, but in the curriculum, but also in the materials uh, that we expose our students to. And we, we might want to have a perfect balance between locally appropriate and globally neutral, but that's not always possible, okay? So sometimes 
we might need to see where the weight of that balance goes. Now, as an example, if we were looking at an advanced level B2 examination, perhaps for university students or curriculum, once again, or materials, and the students are expected to use their language in international context, to access international sources of information, take part in webinars, conferences, um, to be able to view, listen, read uh, information in English about their specialization. And we're dealing with adult learners. Well, then it may be important that we actually, and fair, that we may put the weight on the global rather than the local. But if we look at a different use case and we look at beginner level learners, A1, and used in a local school system with younger learners, 13, 14 year olds in a junior high school context, maybe we need to put the weight on the locally appropriate. So for example, we might wanna be very careful in, uh, about the topics and situations that they're going to be familiar to the students. We might wanna show them pictures that they are uh, also reflective of the environment they're in. We may need to be very careful about the vocabulary we use, that it's something that they're going to be familiar with and understand in the local context. Um, and these are decisions that we need to make about adapting the standards for and examinations, curriculum and material for local situations and global situations. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try and wrap up very quickly. Uh, standards as part of a wider system, I think, how do we implement these differently depending on the parts of the, the uh, triangle? So for assessment, we might need to be very, very focused for summative assessment and very, very careful about how we actually use those features. So pronunciation, for example, in an examination, we might want to be very careful to make sure that we use the pronunciation that we know the students are going to be familiar with. We might want to limit the vocabulary to things that we know is going to be useful and suitable for measuring B1. But in the actual delivery, we might say, well, let's be more flexible. Actually, here we can afford to be uh, more diverse, expose the students to different kinds of pronunciation, cultural issues and ideas, different kinds of American English or British English, because they can be supported by the teacher. We aren't going to be measuring them directly here yet. We're going to be helping them learn. So we want to be more flexible with the features of the system. And in fact, even with assessment, when we take that into the classroom, the formative assessment is going to look very different into what the summative assessment will need to look like. And the balance of those features will once again be quite different. So wrapping up quickly, some of the things to avoid, we need to avoid a blanket one size fits all target approach. Everyone needs to be this level across the whole country. And this is something we see quite a lot of. And usually that's not what actually is achievable. Okay, we need to avoid setting unrealistic targets. Uh, quite often we have national targets where everyone is expected to get to B2 or, or, or et cetera. And maybe that might be useful and realistic for uh, certain elements like English teachers in university. It might not be useful for taxi drivers. Okay, so we need to think about what the targets are and the time that's gonna be achieved. We looked at what the um, levels were in Europe and even 13 years after the CFR was introduced, a great diversity of levels. So let's not expect the world to change tomorrow. We need to focus on assess, we need to avoid focusing on assessment as the driver. We know that assessment's important, but if we implement the CFR only through the tests as a way of driving change, we know from experience that doesn't work. All parts of that triangle need to be included. And let's not fit a square peg into a round hole. The CFR was always meant as a starting point. It will need to be adapted not adopted as is. Okay, it's very important. The bulk of it will be useful, but it needs to be adapted and made suitable for the local context. So things we can do are be patient. It takes time to implement change across the system. Be flexible, adapt, don't adopt. Monitor, evaluate, and innovate. So the system should be driven by the standards, but we need to actually also change the standards over time. We've seen the CFR adapt, introducing the companion volume. Be collaborative, whether at a national level or at an institution level, working together with colleagues, the institution, the top of the institution, the top of the Ministry of Education need to work together with teachers and on the ground level in the classroom, we need to work together with our colleagues and with our students to achieve the opportunities that well-designed standards, which I believe the CFR uh, do offer us. Sorry for going a little bit over time and thank you very much. One thing I will just say before I finish, is to tell you that there is a MOOC 
that is coming up in November, at November the 16th on classroom assessment, which explores some of these ideas further and particularly how you can develop classroom assessment techniques uh, for formative assessments. So we're looking at classroom assessment. And if you're interested in that MOOC, there's more information online at the British Council and that will be available in, it's free in uh, November. And so please do join in that if you're interested in classroom assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dunley, for your insight. I would like to remind all attendees, the recording of this session will be available on British Council Indonesia YouTube and link to download a certificate and presenters PPT will be provided once you complete the survey. The link will be shared uh, at the end of the session. So our next speaker, Ms. Cecilia Setiawati Halimi, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Linguistics, Faculty of Humanities, Universitas Indonesia. She has been the vice president of Teflins since 2003. She earned her BA in Linguistics from Universitas Indonesia, her MA in English Language Teaching from the University of Warwick, UK, and her PhD in ELT from Latrobe University, Australia. Her field of interest include language assessment, English for specific purposes, English language teaching and teacher education. Her presentation will share about standards and reference frameworks in the Indonesian context, the aims and ambitions. Please welcome Ms. Cecilia Halimi. Okay, well, thank you, Ibu Farida. Let me share the screen first. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to share my thoughts on assessment standards and reference frameworks in the Indonesian context. I'd like to start my presentation by quoting Rispi and Lingert's opinion related to the educational purposes. According to them, educational purposes have been redefined in terms of a narrow set of concern about human capital development and the role of education must play is to meet the needs of the global economy to ensure the competitiveness of national economy. This shows that educational purposes now really focus on developing human capital to meet the needs of the global economy. This means that we need to prepare uh, global citizens. And in relation to this, Israel says that preparing learners to be a global citizen is uh, not only be about equipping them with the ability to communicate, but also about enabling them to know about the culture, custom, and history of a foreign country so far as better adjust themselves to the new working or living environment. In relation to this, I think we all agree that English as a global language can mediate access to this information and knowledge. In addition, English also can mediate access to employment, both locally and globally. Because of that, English language education has been at the forefront of developing human capital. This is now very obvious in all parts of the world. And from our neighbors, we can see 
uh, some example, for example, from China, in which English, English language education is currently a compulsory requirement for education at all levels. And in Japan, they have just uh, done a revision of the course of study, uh, and this includes a reform of English language teaching in Japan. In Indonesia, our former research technology and higher education minister, Professor Dr. Muhammad Nasir, also believes that making English interaction compulsory at the tertiary level we really better prepare university students to compete in the Asian economic zone. While this belief exists among Indonesian, let's review the current practice in English language education and assessment in Indonesia. Of these two pictures, which do you think? reflects the current practice in English language education as assessment in Indonesia. The one with white circles, the picture with the white circles, or the pictures with the blue circles. Let's review the current practice. Reform of English language teaching and assessment have been done or are in progress in many parts of the world. Based on the current situation, we can say that Indonesian government has not considered it necessary to do any reform and develop a national framework of reference for English language education and assessment. According to Dr. Siti Wahida, a senior lecturer in Universitas Negeri Jakarta, it seems that the government takes it for granted that parents will pay great attention to improving the English language proficiency of their children because English is very important for the future of their children. And because of this, we can see that English is only offered as a local content subject in primary schools in Indonesia. And there is also no official document that explain ex explicitly the English, the English level proficiency that has to be achieved by junior and senior high school student and university student from the English studies program when they graduate. There is no such document. English textbooks for junior and senior high school student published by the government were written by paying more attention to the Indonesian qualification framework than standards and references framework of English language education. These are the books most used in state schools in Indonesia. But of course, there are also other books used uh, in schools in Indonesia, especially good state and private school in big cities or SPK schools. These schools use textbooks written by international publisher that really pay attention to the common European framework of references. But the number is of course not many. At higher education institution, the situation is more or less the same. The quality of English education in the English studies program is varied and the reference used in establishing the curriculum in the Indonesian quali and the reference used in establishing the curriculum is the Indonesian qualification framework that does not specifically explain about English language education. So the conclusion is there is no clear information in terms of the proficiency levels to be attained at each educational state and among different departments of education in Indonesia. How about language assessment? Various forms of English language assessment are used in Indonesia. In junior and senior high school level, the formative English language assessment is usually written by the English teachers themselves. The quality is varied depending 
on the quality of the English teachers in each school. In addition to formative, there are also summative tests, which are written by a team of test writers. The example is the English exam for the national school exam. Another example is the university entrance test. And another one, which is also used by the government for the certification of uh, teachers is TOEIC, uh, Test of English Proficiency, which, was, uh, which has been developed by Taflin. And then there is also another test which is widely used in universities. This is what is called the English Proficiency Test. This test is basically developed by the English study program in each university. And because of this, even though it is uh, claimed as TOEFL-like, the standards are not the same from one university to another university. In the national standardized tests, such as Cambridge English Assessment, the main suit exams, IELTS, IPP TOEFL, and IBT TOEFL are also widely used in Indonesia. According to Mr. Srimba, the director of the Authorized Exam Center for Cambridge English Assessment in Indonesia, the main such exam from Cambridge are mostly used by state, private, and SPK schools. So uh, it is still very limited. The other international standardized tests are used for applying a scholarship, studying abroad, or joining a double degree program in some Indonesian universities. Another case which also needs uh, our attention is the use of English as a medium of instruction. While ministerial pronouncement may have given encouragement to higher education institution to introduce English as a medium of instruction, there is no official policy and the legal, the legal position of EMI is also doubtful. Institution are seeking a justification for EMI in varied legal clauses because the law states that Indonesian should be the medium of instruction. There appears to be a dichotomy between what is required by law and what is happening in practice. The English language test score requirement and the kinds of English tests recognized by each university for joining a double degree program are also varied. We can check this from the website of uh, the, dif uh, the different universities in Indonesia uh, that have this double degree program. So the conclusion again, there is no national standard or references framework in English language assessment that can be referred to by education institution. So what should we do? Well, I think it is time for us to propose to the government to establish a national framework of reference for English language education and assessment. I'd like to quote Alderson's opinion about this. According to Alderson, this involves not only the educational policy making and implement, uh, policy making and implementation at the macro political le level, but it also requires the great role of individual players, individuals within an educational institution to respond to and to take action. So it's our responsibility also. Alderson also argued that politics with a small p includes not only institutional politics, but also personal politics, the motivation of the actors themselves and their agendas. And personal politics can influence language education both in day-to-day -day affairs and in projects for innovation and change. So what should we do? 
Should we adopt, adapt, or create a language framework? We just heard from uh, Jay's uh, presentation that maybe uh, adopting is not the right thing to do, uh, adopting the existing framework. Well, measures of language proficiency are meant to be a meta language shared by language teachers, learners, and assessors. However, for, for various political, social, cultural, and economic reasons, different measures of language proficiency have been developed in different parts of the world. In countries and regions in Asia, CPR, uh, C, CFR is also used but not without problems. In Japan, it was found that the can-do descriptors were too narrowly focused to be useful for teachers to reflect on teaching and construct teaching syllabus. The experience of aligning general English proficiency tests in Taiwan with the CEFR has suggested that within the, CF the CEFR there is a lack of sufficiently detailed descriptor for describing how well learners at a particular CEFR level perform. Burns also caution us against simple and inappropriate transfer of CEFR content decision to other educational contexts. And he suggested that framework like the CEFR, which which is context-free, though by no means context-indifferent, can, should, and even must be translated into context-relevant forms in diverse educational environments in order to be implemented. So, adoption of the, CV, uh, the CFR would be a simplistic solution to the need for a national framework. The six-level structure is neat and simple, and has been substantiated to some extent by empirical evidence. However, the structure may not suit the need for providing guidance to English language teaching and learning in Indonesia. Therefore, there are two possible solutions. The first one is the adaptation of the CEFR, or the second one is creating a new framework with a structure of proficiency levels tailored to the needs of English language education and assessment in Indonesia. However, the second choice is not an easy one. But of course, this will no doubt be more functionally efficient and user-friendly. The challenges that we have to face if we choose the second one, or uh, even uh, or the second one or the first one, the construction and implementation of such a national framework requires substantial research and strategic planning to form a coherent theory and systematic practice of English language education specific to the Indonesian context. It requires cooperation among educational institutions and communication between educational institutions and government organization. The third challenge, it is likely to meet considerable individual resistance. And practitioners of English language education in Indonesia may find it difficult to understand and apply the proficiency levels and illustrative descriptors in their routine practices. As Jamie, uh, Jamie has already explained that the teacher training is very important if we, we want to implement this smoothly. It is anticipated that teachers may be reluctant to explore new pedagogic approaches and take on a new set of requirements. In addition to those, Local or school-based assessment developers may feel obliged to align their assessment to the new framework. And the existing large-scale assessment should also be aligned to the framework. So there are too many challenges, but as Anderson has already mentioned, uh, I would like to invite you all 
through this presentation to be individual who take action to build a culture of innovation and change. So let's uh, take action related to this national framework so that the, the language education and assessment in Indonesia can be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Cecilia Halimi. So our next speaker, Dr. Willy Renandia, is a principal lecturer at the EEL Department at National Institute of Education, Singapore. He has taught in many parts of Asia, including Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. He holds an MA in TESOL and a PhD in Educational Psychology. His teaching and research interests include second and foreign language, pedagogy, reading, language testing, and curriculum development. He has published research articles in various journals and authored an ESL textbook. Dr. Renandia will talk about improving English language teachers' proficiency, the issues and prospects. Please welcome Dr. Willy Renandia. Thank you very much, Farida. Uh, I would like to have Pak Joko, Pak Kolm, and Ibu Cecilia to have the video on and also the audio on as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, it's about three o'clock in Singapore. Uh, maybe about two in Indonesia and maybe some other times in different parts of the world. Uh, before I start, I'd like to make sure that everyone is on the same page uh, because I saw some of the questions from the audience. What does CFR stand for? So here you go. CFR stands for Common European Framework of Reference. Pronunciation is C-E-F-R, but if you say it quickly, it becomes CIFR. All right. Uh, it's, it's very well known. Uh, it's known among foreign language teachers, those people who teach Japanese as a foreign language, people who teach German as, as, as a foreign language, or people who teach Mandarin as a foreign language. Uh, it's known also by English language teachers in many different parts of Asia, including Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, like Busisida mentioned just now, uh, CFR is not very uh, familiar to many English language teachers, although CFR is something that other foreign language teachers in Indonesia teaching Japanese, uh, Mandarin, French, and other uh, languages, they're very familiar with this and they've been using it for a while. So if you want to know more, if you are an English language teacher in Indonesia and you want to know more about CFR, speak to your foreign language teacher colleagues, those teaching Japanese and other uh, languages. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation this afternoon uh, is based on a paper that I did together with Pak Joko and Pak Fuad. Uh, feel free to download the uh, article. Uh, if you don't have the gadget to scan my QR code, I'll, I'm going to show it again at the end of my presentation. Okay. Let, let me get started now. My presentations, very, very easily organized. I want to talk about proficiency. I want to talk about what actually is this thing called English language proficiency and why it is important for you, for me, for English language teachers. And then the next bit, I want to talk about how we can improve, how teachers can improve their proficiency and how teachers also can help improve students' proficiency. And finally, uh, if you are interested in looking at proficiency, how do you go about researching it? What are some of the topic areas that might be of uh, interest to you as an English language teacher? So that is my plan for today. And I hope I can do it in about 20 minutes or so. It's a bit ambitious, but let me try. Uh, see if I can do it in 20 minutes. Okay, let's begin with a definition of proficiency. 
Well, there are many ways of defining proficiency, but I find this very easy, very simple definition to be very useful. Language proficiency or English language proficiency refers to one's ability to use language for a variety of communicative purposes. The key word here is ability. So you learn a language so that you can use it. I think that's the main thing about proficiency, but using language for what? Many purposes, many reasons to tell a story, for example. Yeah. A column, for example, if you're coming late, you know, after working so hard, you, you may want to tell your, you know, your wife a story, whether a true story or, or not so true a story. You want to share some good news or some bad news. You use English or you use other languages to tell or to share good news to other people. You may want to use language to compliment uh, people who have done a good job. So later today, I expect you to compliment each of the uh, three speakers that we have today. We spend a lot of time working on the presentation, so it's only right for you to say thank you to us. Like to Pu Cecilia, for example. Pu Cecilia, you did a very nice job just now. It was very clearly presented. Write a report. I mean, that's a little bit more challenging. I think that you use language in order to write a report, give a speech, like what many of us are doing now. And uh, the last one, you know, people with a higher level of proficiency may be able to do this, to navigate a difficult conversation. Ibu Farida, for example, if you've been working for, for the British Council for a while now, and you are looking for a major increase in your salary. I mean, that is not an easy topic, yeah? Uh, but, you know, you need to use language in such a way so that you can persuade calm to increase your salary by, I don't know, three times, if that is possible. <laughs> okay. So this is what proficiency is all about. Proficiency is the ability to use language for a wide variety of purposes. And what are some of the indicators? When you say that Busisil is very proficient in English, but Joko is proficient in English, but Kolm is not so proficient in Bahasa Indonesia, what do we mean by that? What are some of the things that you need to be able to see? What are some of the indicators or dimensions of proficiency. Let me share with you four indicators. Now, these are indicators that you will find in any kind of language tests, whether it's CFR, whether it's your own language test, you will have to include, you know, at least four of these components or elements in your assessment. Accuracy, how good or how many mistakes or how accurate is your language? Do you make a lot of pronunciation errors? Do you make a lot of grammatical errors? How accurate is your language? Fluency has to do with your ability to do things using the language quickly and easily. How smooth is your language? Do you stop from time to time in order to convey your message to other people? Next one is another important indicator. This is what distinguishes a beginner from the uh, higher intermediate for the uh, more advanced students, complexity. Uh, whether and to what extent somebody can use a wider variety of vocabulary and grammatical structures. Yeah. So that helps us distinguish between lower intermediate and upper intermediate. And finally, appropriacy, an extremely important concept. Yes, it's important for you to be linguistically accurate, to be fluent, to use complex language, but at the same time, you want, you know, we want to make sure that you are able to use the language in a way that is nice, in a way that is polite, in a way that is not rude and so on, at least from a cultural, uh, social cultural perspective. So these are the four areas uh, that need to be uh, looked at. Calm, but calm. Using this as, uh, as uh, general indicators, where would you put yourself in, in terms of your proficiency? Bahasa Indonesia, yeah, not English. Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> Uh, low, mid, high, or uh, somewhere there? Well, Pat Willie, I would have to hold my hand up and say that I, <laughs> I, my Bahasa Indonesian is, is not very strong. Uh, so I would be a, a beginner. Okay. Um, but I think that generally when I learn languages, yeah. I tend to be more confident in trying to use the language and not mm. make mistakes. Ah. So I, I'm, I'm quite... When I have, I'm quite good at learning phrases and expressions. Mm. So my vocabulary is often quite good, 
Yes. And my fluency is quite good. Mm. I'm sure in all the languages that I've tried to learn that yeah. my uh, accuracy is very low. Mm. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm generally somebody who tries yeah. to learn vocabulary and yes. use it and yes. not be afraid of making mistakes. Mm. So yes, and that, yes. And that is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, when, when you learn a language in a place where the language is used widely, like you learning Bahasa Indonesia in Indonesia, I think people pay more attention to your ability to speak fluently and appropriately. Accuracy mm, is probably not that important, yeah. Yeah, at least in, in, in the real world situation. But interestingly, in the classroom, we tend to give a lot of attention on accuracy. We feel very unhappy if our students make grammatical mistakes or any other uh, language mistakes. Let me move on. So these are some of the indicators that people usually use to assess proficiency. Okay, now if you look at these two very widely used standards for measuring proficiency, TOEFL and IELTS, they're very popular, they're widely used in the world but the key question when we look at, when we consider assessment is, yes, it's good for who? Is it good for you? Is it good for me? Is it good for teachers? Is it good for students? Or is it good for the general public? I understand that in some places like Indonesia, civil servants will have to show some level of standards using either IELTS or TOEFL. But Joko, would you, would you, would you, would you say that these two uh, tests are relevant, appropriate to assess the uh, proficiency of, let's say, teachers, English teachers in Indonesia? So, right. Thank you, Wavili. I think those two tests are appropriate to, yeah. uh, what, what, to examine, uh, yes. to measure yeah, yes. the teacher's uh, proficiency. We know that uh, proficiency uh, is not uh, so connected to yeah. what you call as a curriculum. So mm. I think uh, anyone can take uh, these two, mm. what you call to test uh, yes. to measure their proficiency. Yes, yes, excellent point. Yes. So this test, you, you can take this test, you know, to measure your general proficiency. But actually, if you look at these two tests very carefully, these two tests have been designed in order to test somebody's academic English language ability, especially those who want to study overseas. If you want to come to Singapore, for example, because Engl uh, Singapore is an English speaking country and all the teaching is done through English, we want to make sure that you are able to understand you know, textbooks and also the uh, lectures in the English language. And this test may be probably the most uh, you know, relevant uh, for these people. But if you are not going overseas, if, you, if, you, if your profession requires you to use English in the classroom for teaching purposes, uh, these two tests probably may not be the best tests out there. Yeah? Okay, we'll explore this a bit further. And, 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 and this is where a different framework may be needed. This is a framework that has been introduced early on by the other two speakers. Uh, is the CFR uh, framework. The CFR framework is interesting because, because the indicators are clearly, clearly measuring ability. What can you do with the language? Come, but come, what can you do with Bahasa Indonesia? Can you get angry in Bahasa Indonesia? <laughs> That's a bit difficult. That's high level. <laughs> I'll answer the question. I think I have. Uh, when it comes to giving directions yes. in a taxi from the airport, yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely a B1 in Bahasa Indonesian. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yes. In yes. other areas, mm. uh, uh, my proficiency is much lower. So if I wanted to study yes. uh, in a university in Indonesia, mm in Bahasa Indonesian, yeah. then I definitely wouldn't have uh, the proficiency level required. Yes, I think you need to reach at least a B2 level in order for you to be able to follow you know, lectures and read text in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, uh, the uh, framework actually is very straightforward. A1 and A2 is what we used to call elementary. Not exactly the same, but it's essentially it's elementary or basic level of English. 
B1, B2 is intermediate level. So C1, C2 is advanced level, yeah? So different classifications, different categories, but they more or less, they mean, uh, you know, the same thing. Uh, Busisil, do I dare asking you, what is your English level of proficiency? Or do we need to use a different scale for you? C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the scale is not there. <laughs> No, based on the last IELTS that I took a long time ago. A long time ago, yeah. Yeah, it was C1. <laughs> C1, yes. So that was a long time ago. So right now, it's at least C2. I can see very clearly from your presentation that you are a C2 speaker. Very highly uh, accurate, fluent, and very, very competent as well. Uh, later, we'll explore this further, yeah? Uh, let's look at how the framework uh, has been used in different places in the region. I have an example here in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia has adopted the framework and the government actually has you know, a policy that specifies very clearly the expected level of proficiency for different groups of people in education from preschool all the way to teacher education. So if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a language educator or any other you know, uh, school educator, you must reach a level of C1. English teaches some more. I mean, you know, C1 is like the, uh, the target level of proficiency that is required of uh, teachers, teachers of English in particular. Have they reached the target? The answer is probably not yet. Uh, a number of people are very, very competent. They are maybe C1 or C2. Uh, but some teachers probably need support, need help to get to that level. Uh, the same thing is happening in Vietnam, for example. Now, Vietnam is interesting. Uh, the uh, government has a target level of proficiency for all of the English language teachers in schools. I think, if I'm not mistaken, for high school teachers, their target is B2. B2. B2 is like uh, somewhere uh, slightly below the advanced level. Yeah. Now, the question again is, uh, have the teachers reached that level? All the teachers, the answer is no, not yet. I think the government is still working on upscaling and uh, improving the uh, proficiency of English teachers in Vietnam. But I think they are making progress. Uh, they started about 10 years ago and uh, the uh, government has a project, a 10 year project called the uh, Project 2020. This is a national project on English language proficiency. Very interesting. Uh, just very quick, but Joko, I think you've been traveling all over Indonesia. I think you may be able to say roughly, kira kira, roughly, English teachers in Indonesia, where are they right now? And where do you think they should be at? Uh, in, the in reality, probably B1. 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 Or B2. Okay, okay. Yeah, teachers think, in the audience. I think uh, they should be in B2 at least, or C1. Okay. But in reality, I think uh, in B1. Okay, B1. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think this is a difficult question for me to say, but since Pak Joko is the president of TAFL, uh, Taflin, I think he can say that. <laughs> so maybe at B1, uh, some maybe at B2, a small yes, number, right. a small number of our teachers are in C1. I've seen some of them. Very small yes. number, but really, very small number. Very small. <laughs> yes, Pak <Bakom. laughs> But I, I think it might, when we look at that, when you break yeah. down the skills, yeah. I think that the, the reading and listening, the receptive True. skills of English teachers in Indonesia might be much higher. Good point, yes. But yes. the productive skills of speaking mm. yes. and uh, writing might be a bit yes. long. Yes, I think that's a very important uh, thing to uh, consider when we assess uh, a teacher's or anyone's proficiency in, in a language. You know, somebody may be proficient in speaking and listening and reading, but maybe not in writing. And this is very common. So, so it's not a one-off thing for everyone, but somebody may be a C1 in speaking and listening and reading, but maybe only B2 in writing. And this is very common, uh, especially among those people who study overseas, their writing skill may be lagging uh, behind. The IELTS, Overall IELTS score, for example, may be at seven or seven and a half or even eight. 
but their writing may still be at 6.5. So very common. Okay, number two. Now, this is something that is so important for you, for me, and all the language uh, educators out there in the audience. Why is proficiency uh, important? I think it's very obvious, you know, because you're an English language teacher, uh, it's part of your professional knowledge and also professional identity. You are an English language teacher, so you must know the English language that you are teaching. I think that seems to be very obvious. I think you have seen something like this. This is a, like a simplified version of the kind of professional knowledge that the teacher must have. Proficiency in the language, knowledge about the language, and also knowledge about the pedagogy, general pedagogy, and also content specific or English language pedagogy. Yeah, so I'm going to say this. All three are important, equally important as part of the, uh, your professional training. You must have developed some level of competence in these three areas. But today I'm going to say that proficiency is so important. If your proficiency is not up there, I can probably say that your knowledge about English may not be good as well. Because these two are related. How can you, you know, how can your knowledge about how the language works, how can you explain certain grammatical rules in the English language if your English language proficiency is not very good? Chances are you may be, you know, making quite a bit of, you know, inaccurate, uh, you know, explanations about the specific language features that you're trying to explain. So I would say that proficiency play a role, plays a, an important role in, in your understanding, in your knowledge of the language, and also in the way you teach the language in the classroom as well. Uh, this is where I need to bring in some research uh, that has been done, research that has looked at the relationship between language proficiency and teaching effectiveness. I would like to invite you to check this journal uh, 2017 issue is a special issue looking at there's like 10 articles there looking at the uh, very interesting relationship between language proficiency and teacher proficiency let me just summarize what i have learned from reading uh, all these uh, research uh, studies on teacher proficiency now here are some of them now here are some of the benefits of people with higher levels of proficiency in English. Typically they are more confident teachers. When they teach, you know, they can, they can you know, project that confidence in front of the students because they know what they're doing. They know that they can explain things related to the English language. Number two, you can be also a good model for your students. It's like saying to the students, hey kids, this is me. I was born here in Indonesia, but I have been able to acquire a high level of English. And I'm sure if I can do it, you know, you can do it too. A good model of a successful language learner. And number three, this is another important thing. Uh, when it comes to pedagogy, you can teach English in English, not 100%, not maybe 95% but at least about 75 to 80% of what you do in the classroom when you teach English, I think you need to use English. Now, this is very important because English, when you speak English, maybe that is the main source of language information for your students, especially students who are learning English in remote places in Indonesia. They won't have a lot of access to understanding, to listening, to reading uh, the language because resources are not available. Here are some other benefits. You'll be able to provide more accurate and appropriate feedback to your students. In other words, the quality of your feedback will be much better. Now, feedback is so important because feedback is an opportunity for you to point out to the students, hey, kids, you are still right here. I think you need to be able to uh, work on you know, certain areas of your language proficiency. So this is what probably Colm uh, said early on about uh, reflection on the, or feedback on learning and feedback for learning in the future. Uh, it's also been observed that 
the more proficient English language teachers are more able to provide richer language input. Again, language input, the importance of input cannot be understated. It's so important, especially in places where English is learned as a foreign language. And finally, they can improvise. But the last point is very important because very often when we plan a lesson, you know, the actual lesson may not actually happen in the way that we have planned. And you get into big trouble very often because you know, things are not moving anywhere. Now, apparently the higher proficiency teachers are able to stand on their feet and to improvise, to do things in order to make the class you know, alive again. So improvisation uh, is another thing. Now, here are some pictures of teachers, award-winning teachers from Singapore. I took it from uh, Google earlier today. Uh, these are teachers who are known to be very good, very effective, very inspiring, and things like that. And the question to us is this, is proficiency the main cause or the only cause or the most important cause of effectiveness in teaching? Let me ask Bu Cecilia. Bu Cecilia, you've been teaching for you know, many, many years, yeah? Uh, do you think proficiency is so important that it determines the quality of your teaching? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is a trick question, Ibu. Uh, the answer usually for something like this is, well, it depends. <laughs> Colm, yes, but Colm. <laughs> I'm actually going to come out and say no. Yeah. Um, I mm. think I think it is inc incredibly important. Yeah. The more proficient you are, all of those um, benefits yeah. you've outlined are, are going to be mm. there. Yeah. Good pedagogy and knowledge of your methodology is yeah, most, absolutely the most important. But yeah. I think you need to aim for a B two. You know, maybe the yes. difference is if you don't have B two. Yeah. And it is the most important factor. Yeah. But beyond yeah. B2, yes. I don't think, for example, mm. yes. who, I know English teachers, mm. native English teachers, who are clearly a C2. Yes. Fluent, but they're yeah. terrible teachers. Ah, terrible. I've, yeah, I've, seen, I've seen those. But yes. They don't know the methodology or, or how to plan a lesson. Yeah. So yeah. It, it is important to a certain mm. level, but then it becomes less important. Yes. Yeah, people, I hope you listen to Colm's explanation just now, and that is exactly what research is telling me. Uh, yes, so yes, there seems to be a very good relationship between proficiency and teaching effectiveness, but up to a certain level. I think that's what Colm is trying to say earlier on. There is a threshold level of proficiency that you need to have. Beyond that level, proficiency is no longer Proficiency is still important, but it's no longer the most important factor. So other factors are also important. Other factors are linked to effective teaching as well. Uh, many examples. Let me just give you some. I think Carl mentioned about you know, pedagogical knowledge or pedagogical skills and things like that. Uh, if you translate those into simple uh, teaching ideas, this is what happens. So in a typical classroom, what makes the classroom alive, what makes the students learn is the teacher's ability to pitch the lesson at the right level. The pitching is important. The pacing is also important, yeah? Not too fast, not too slow, just nice. The engagement level is also extremely important. The ability of the teacher to engage 90% of the students, 90% of the time. I think that is how I would define uh, what an effective lesson is all about. That the teacher is able to engage everyone and that requires a very high level of classroom management skill and also another important factor is how you can contextualize, how you can personalize, how you can customize your lesson so that the whole thing, your lessons, the contents, the activities click just like that. Yeah. So these are things that make your lesson really exciting. Having said that, proficiency continues to be important. If you are not at that level, at that threshold level, then it's difficult for you 
I mean, your students may like you. The students may find you to be an inspiring teacher or inspirational teacher. But to be inspiring is just one aspect of teaching. What we want is a teacher who is inspiring, but also, uh, you know, but also uh, effective, effective in making sure that learning actually happens. Next is how, how to improve proficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this early on and mentioned this, yeah? Proficiency refers to one's ability to use language for a variety of communicative purposes. Ability. Now, now the question here, you know, the answer to this question depends on how you see language, how you see, how you approach the teaching of language in the classroom. There are many different approaches, but I'm going to try to simplify you know, these different approaches into two major categories. The first one is what I would call teaching language as knowledge. Teaching language as knowledge. That actually is what we often see happening in the classroom in many different parts of the world. You teach language like an object. You teach language in terms of rules, in terms of regulations, in terms of drills and things like that. And the teaching usually is very linear. This week, 10 words only and nothing else. The week after, another 10 words. Yeah. And then the week after, the present tense only. The week after, the continuous tense only. Learning is linear step by step. I like this word step by step. By step. I think teachers are very familiar with the idea that, well, when you teach a difficult subject, you need to do it step by step. I think that and very often, the step-by-step -step teaching is accompanied by very, very explicit explanation of all the grammatical rules, the rules of the language, the step-by-step -step teaching. Unfortunately, we got it wrong. Uh, I think we got it wrong. When we, when we devote, dedicate all of our teaching time, teaching language as knowledge using a linear approach and doing a very explicit way of teaching the language, I think we will not be able to get the students to develop that ability of using the language. I think we need to move away from that and we should adopt an approach known as teaching language as ability, as opposed to teaching language as knowledge, teaching language as ability. So the assumption here is language learning is nonlinear. You don't start with 10 words today and 20 words another day. It's nonlinear. You learn language as whole. Something that is meaningful is likely to stay in your head. And interestingly, what research tells us is this, language learning is largely implicit. Let me say this very carefully. Language learning is largely implicit. And this is the type of knowledge that enables you to speak, to read, to write, and to understand the language. Okay, I, I hope you're with me on that, yeah? Two major approaches. One is teaching language as knowledge. The other one is teaching language as ability. Now, here is a quote that you want, or I have memorized. So I remember this quote very well. And I'm going to say this again and again to different group of people who ask me about what is this ability? What is this proficiency? Extremely important. Based on years of research, the ability to produce language relatively easily for communicative purposes draws heavily on implicit knowledge. In other words, we are looking at the right-hand side, yeah? Yeah, and that is the source. And ma many other researchers, including me, would say the same thing. So this is our job as an English language teacher. If you want to improve on your proficiency, this is the way to go. If you want to improve your students' English language proficiency, this is also the way to go. And the question then is methodology, how? So what is the best way to improve language proficiency then if that is the case? Well, people, depending on you know, who you ask, you know, they will give you different answers to this question. But if you ask people like me and Pa Joko and Pa Kom and Ibu Cecilia, hopefully they will also say the same thing as me. Here you go. It's through extensive reading. And these are people who are big, uh, you know, uh, advocates 
you know, sponsors of extensive reading. Uh, the guy on the right hand side there is Richard Day from the University of Hawaii, and he is considered the father of extensive reading. The other three people there are the children or grandchildren of uh, extensive reading. So I'll invite you to read and find out what extensive reading is all about. And uh, a lot of books have been written. Uh, a lot of presentations have been made at conferences, and I think I'm, I'm becoming even more convinced now that extensive reading is probably one of the best ways of improving English language proficiency. I have here some examples of students and also teachers who have developed a very, very high level of proficiency in the English language just by doing a lot of reading uh, on their own uh, outside the classroom. The first one is a student, what used to be a student in Korea. Uh, this is another girl from Thailand, uh, another boy from Vietnam, very high level of proficiency. How about teachers? I've got two teachers here. The first one is uh, one of the uh, committee members of IRA, Indonesian Extensive Reading Association. The other one is from Sanada Dharma University. The other one is Ibu Ifon, also from, uh, from Universitas Malang, uh, Indonesia. Both are very, very good speakers of the English language. I would say the level is C2. At least a spoken, uh, you know, uh, the speaking skill is definitely C2 for me, or even higher than that. Uh, if you need something that is even more uh, convincing to remember, here is a book and a very nice quote. Extensive reading is an excellent teaching approach, universally recognized, universally hailed as being one of the most effective approaches to language teaching, but it is severely underutilized, uh, whether it's in Indonesia, in China, or in different parts of the world. Uh, here is just a something that you might want to consider if you want to provide sources of reading materials to your students you can go online for free materials, but if you have some money, uh, here is one program, a digital library that contains more than 1,000 graded readers in which the students can read and listen to the story at the same time, anytime and anywhere. But you need to pay a little bit. Uh, if you are from remote places, I mean, this is probably one of the best ways for you to, you know, to increase the quantity and also the quality of uh, language input. Uh, I hear that British Council may have some money to sponsor some of the uh, you know, teachers in remote places. Yeah, Cobb? <laughs> now the program has been used in many different places in Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and also in Indonesia. Uh, UNESA, uh, UMY, uh, Atmajaya, UNMO, UM as well. And hopefully very soon, UNS Solo and UE Indonesia. Uh, let me know if I can help you. I know the guy who, who, who developed this program and I can ask for a very, very special discount for you. I will tell you that, I will tell, tell them that you're, you're my good friends. Okay, so very brief now, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Uh, let's say that you are not convinced and you want to find out more about, you know, uh, things related to proficiency. What are some of the things that you may want to look at? Number one, I think it's, 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 I think it's due time, uh, it's high time that Indonesia in particular uh, starts mapping the uh, profile of the uh, English language proficiency of teachers in Indonesia. I think Pak Joko mentioned early on that we do have information about this, but the information tends to be scattered and not systematically uh, made available to policymakers and to decision makers at the school level or at the university level. Number two, you may want to also uh, do a piece of research on the, the kind of challenges uh, that teachers and students encounter when they adopt or adapt the CFR-based proficiency tests. Number three, this is something that is of interest to me actually. You know, knowing the theory is one thing, but knowing how the theory can be applied in the context of at the level of curriculum and syllabus is super, super interesting for me. So reviewing existing curriculum uh, in the school context, as well as in teacher education programs. We want to make sure whether there is a good match 
between what the theory is saying and the development of English language proficiency. For now, I can tell, I can say very briefly that the match is not wonderful. I have seen some curriculum, some syllabuses in the English language departments, in school uh, curriculums as well. The match is not wonderful. And finally, this is something that I personally am interested in. Uh, audience out there, if you are interested, please contact me. I may be able to help you if you're doing your research as part of your MA or PhD. The topic will be something on the effect of extensive reading and extensive listening on language proficiency. Now, the participants would involve both the teachers and the students, in particular, those teachers and students whose level of proficiency uh, is not yet up to standard. The duration should be about six months. Longer is better, but not shorter. It has to be six months or longer. The materials, again, I would suggest X reading because X reading is a complete digital library with uh, LSM, L L learning management system built in to the system. So you can check, you can monitor the uh, reading that the students do. And uh, in terms of procedure, if you can make your students and teachers read 20 minutes a day after six months, I think you will see a very, very remarkable improvement in the student's ability to use language in some way. They may not reach C2 or C1, but I think they may be able to reach up to B1. If you make it a bit longer, like one year, maybe you may be able to get the students to reach a higher level of proficiency on the CFR uh, scale. Finally, this is what we, I have tried to share with you uh, this afternoon. I have looked at English language proficiency. I have looked at the uh, definition, simple definition of proficiency. I have also shared with you why proficiency is important for language teachers, for English language teachers. I have also looked at how, you know, one of the best ways of improving proficiency, this is for students as well as for teachers. And finally, how we can go about, you know, researching or trying to understand uh, the relationship between fluency, uh, fluency development, and maybe later on teaching uh, effectiveness. Now, finally, since you've been a very, very good, nice audience, I'm going to give you some presents, some gift, free of charge. I've got materials here. All of these materials are available for viewing as well as for download, and it's all free, and they're available in my website. The name of the website is Willie's ELT Corner, www.willyrenandia.com. It's completely free. If you view those materials and download those books before the end of today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Willie Renandia. So we are now, um, we will start our Q&A session. We have interesting and tough questions from the attendees. So for this first question, I would like to ask uh, to all presenters, um, we can start. First, with uh, Miss Cecilia and pa, uh, pa Willy, and then uh, Dr. Dunley can add um, based on his experience working with uh, many governments. So the question is, how can we integrate global framework into our national curriculum? Because as you know that Indonesia is a big country consists of thousands of culture and ethnics. So, um, and you know, uh, Indonesia also has local standards. So um, how can we integrate global framework to our national curriculum, uh, to our national framework? Ibu Cecilia? Okay, well, thank you, Ibu Farida. Well, as uh, has been explained by Jamie, I think 
uh, the best one to use is of course by uh, uh, combining yeah, the local, uh, the needs of the local, uh, the local needs and also by paying attention to the global uh, situation. So uh, we don't just uh, adopt the international standard, but we should make some adjustment and uh, the adjustment uh, should be made by paying attention to the local context. I think that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, just, just to add on to that, the, uh, the framework is international in the sense that it was developed in, in, in Europe and also now adopted widely in different places uh, of the world. Uh, locally, individual countries will have to decide you know, what level of proficiency uh, they're trying to achieve uh, to help the students achieve at different levels of education. So, so the uh, starting point before adopting uh, the uh, adapting the standard or the framework is for the authority, for the decision makers, for the policy makers to make a decision. What do we want our students at different levels of education to be able to achieve in terms of their proficiency level? Untuk anak SD, for, for, you know, for primary school teachers, what would be a good level of proficiency? Maybe A1 or A2. Even then, at the A1 of A2 level, you may want to give a lot more emphasis on listening, maybe, and on reading. The speaking and uh, writing may be at the lower level. But that decision will have to be made collectively by decision makers, by policy makers. Uh, at the university level, it has to be decided on by the uh, you know, people in charge of teacher education. Uh, Pak Joko probably can add to that. Okay, sorry, I missed some information, Pak Gili. Mm. What's the, the question? I, I'm sorry. Uh, Farida? Yes, Professor uh, Joko Nurganto, the question is how we can integrate global framework into our national uh, framework? Okay, I think uh, first of all, we have to, uh, what do you call, uh, officially, what do you call, uh, officially adapt or adopt uh, the CFR framework to our uh, national framework. Because uh, as I told you before, that uh, as far as I know, officially, uh, we do not uh, adopt uh, CFR. And then, uh, that is not number one, okay? Uh, after that, uh, we have to align uh, what you call a uh, use uh, CFR yeah, as the, the framework in our in our curriculum. I think the best way to adopt a CFR is to, to integrate CFR into our national curriculum. That's my uh, comment, Pak Willy. Mm. Thank you, uh, Pak Willy and Pak Joko. Um, Jamie, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually what's really interesting is that, yeah, the answers have come from all of those presentations today. Um, I think what we need to remember is that from the beginning, the CFR was never intended to be used as is, even in Europe. Um, it was intended as a starting point that would be adapted. So the authors have always insisted that it needs to be adapted um, and there needs to be more local kind of appropriacy. Now, in terms of the levels, for example, in Finland, they very early on broke the A1 level down into A1.1, A1.2, A1.3, mm. so that they could actually give learning goals in the school system. That's an approach followed by the CFRJ. But the uh, link I showed you to the uh, European language portfolios shows actually that's been done in Europe as well. So mm. it's not just about using it outside of Europe or in Indonesia. It needs to be adapted anywhere you use it. Um, and I think that's really important. And interestingly, what happened with the CFRJ, the pre-A1 descriptors that they developed have now been adopted, adopted back into the CFR in the companion volume that was published in 2020. So work that is done locally can then feed back into the international context as well. And other school systems can learn from that. I think what Willie mentioned is really important just a minute ago as well. The, the flexibility, listening, speaking what do you need that proficiency in the cfr was designed not so that we would say people are b1 it was to give flexibility 
um, apart from the six levels, so just because you've got six levels doesn't mean everyone has to get to the top. Uh, what do you need the language for? Languages for use. So if you're a taxi driver, maybe you need it for different purposes to an English teacher, but also it has skills, reading, listening, writing, speaking, now mediation and other skills. Originally, there were actually 54 different scales within the CFR. There are now more. So not just reading, writing, listening, speaking. Within that, you might have listening to presentations. You might have listening uh, to broadcasts and TV, listening to conversation. So it's what do we need the proficiency for? And it's not one size fits all. It was designed to give us flexibility. So let's not reduce the flexibility. And I think the final comment by Jocko is, is essential. It needs to have a policy decision from above, but the people from below need to be brought in as well. It needs buy-in from both directions. People on the ground need to be working with it and feel they own it, but it needs to have the power of a policy uh, adoption as well. So I think all of the answers to the question are actually in the discussion that's just come out today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jamie Dunley. So the next question is specifically addressed to you. Um, again, Indonesia is a big country. You know, we consist of thousands of cultures and ethnics. So is there any possibility for CFR to be applied well uh, concerning the validity, reliability, discriminatory of an assessment? Well, I think, um, I think Cecilia, once again, has already answered that in terms of, I think, of the three choices, adapting it, not adopting it is the right approach. I think building something from scratch and bottom up is an option, but uh, the CFR took 10 years to implement and another 20 years to add the companion volume. Recently, the China Standards of English were launched in China and that was a, is quite a different framework, but still actually has a lot of shared content and, and it, you know built on what the foundation of the CFR, but it was a massive project to get that uh, instituted. So building something from scratch takes a lot of work. I think adapting is, you know, the CFR works. It's, it's something that people have worked with all over the world. It works if you adapt it. So I don't think that actually taking a global standard in is going to work. Uh, adapting it. The other benefit of adapting it is you have to have teachers and work with them. We, you have to find out what needs to be adapted. You have to run those kinds of programs and projects to actually find out what's needed and then to work with teachers to develop that. So it, it builds that buy-in to the system. And the, the tension between international and local, as we said, in microcosm, that is within Indonesia. So one system, a framework, you'll need a framework for Indonesia, but that doesn't mean that the framework should be applied in exactly the same way in every part of Indonesia or in every part of the school system. It should look different for primary school students mm as it would to university students. But then again, it should also look different for primary school teachers. And I think if I come back to what Willie's comments about the proficiency of teachers, I think once again, we need to say, who are they teaching? What level do they need to actually, what, you know, what level do they need to convey? Mm. And that, the balance between the importance of pedagogy and proficiency might be different for a primary school teacher than it is for a university teacher, for instance. So let's be flexible and not try and impose one uh, system on everything. But we need a framework within which to be flexible. And the CFR gives us the framework, but we need to be flexible within that framework. Okay, thank you, uh, Jamie. So, um, Miss Cecilia, Pat Willy, and Pat Joko, um, yeah. you mm -hmm. might want to take this question. Before we jump into a conclusion, whether we adapt one assessment as our national standardized in English education, do you think it is necessary to um, also uh, have a revision or reform in our national curriculum first, especially in English curriculum? Uh, Joko is an expert in that area. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well, uh, what I should say in this case. <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we have to have uh, the general framework, yeah, as Jimmy said, yeah, 
and I, I agree in this case that we have, uh, uh, we officially adopt one, what they call one general uh, framework, yeah, say CFR. So we have to revise the curriculum. So uh, we will have uh, what they call the common grounds in this case, yeah. Uh, what I mean by general here is that, uh, uh, of course, in the top, we have the general framework. But in the implementation, yeah, uh, we could uh, localize, yeah, we could localize uh, the, the implementation depending on the context where a teaching and ass assessment, uh, what you call it, conducted in this case. But uh, I think uh, curriculum is very important here. Uh, curriculum as the curriculum as product uh, refers to the, the blueprint for the enactment of uh, teaching and assessment. So I think uh, improving revisions of curriculum is important. But once again, so how could we improve the curriculum? Yeah, so that we can have a, a quote and quote quote. Yeah, once again, we have to uh, adopt one general framework. And in this context, I agree that uh, GFR is uh, one of the best uh, framework to, to adopt and to adapt in this case. Mm. It is my, my opinion. Maybe about will and yes. we'll see I, th I think when we say that is yeah, when we say that is a good framework, I think we are referring to the fact that CFR assesses ability. Remember that CFR assesses language using ability. Now, once yes. we adopt that, what is interesting is this, one, once we adopt or adapt, you know, CFR, uh, right. you know, the teaching that happens will have to change as well, because that's how yeah. you are assessed. Yeah, the assessment is about how you can do things with the language. And if you want to help your students to pass that kind of examination or that kind of assessment, then you need to change the way you teach. You need to teach, you need sure. to develop activities that prepare you know, students to be able to use language for uh, functional purposes. And sure. uh, that's just to add a bit on that. Uh, if I understand correctly, Indonesia does not have a reference point yet. The reference point is very, very vague. Yeah. At the end of high school, students will be able to do this. But, but what is this? It's not very clear. Now, CFR helps specifies that very clearly. And if you I, are a B1, then you'll be able to do one, two, three, four, five, six things in terms of listening, in terms of writing, in terms of reading, in terms of speaking, and so on and so forth. And I think one lesson that we should learn, and if we look back to the report from Europe about implementation in Europe, but if we look at Japan, Vietnam, yeah. a lot of the countries that have tried to implement the CFR, the key issue that arises is that it's implemented and then teachers are brought in later. Mm. So it has to be about uh, pre-service training for teachers. The CFR needs to be in teacher training from the beginning or the locally adapted framework, the standards that you're going to use. They have to be built into training and teachers need to understand them. They need to own them. Um, mm. and not just be told to use them, I think. So teacher yeah. training is a really, really important part of making sure that mm. the standards are implemented. Yes, that's, that's really, really a very important point to, you know, to, to emphasize, uh, you know, universities like Pak Joko's university will have to take the lead uh, when you, pre because yours is a teacher training institution, you are preparing the future English language teachers. So if you yeah, want I mean, these teachers part, yeah. to be yes, <laughs> if you want these teachers to be able to, you know, to focus more on communicative abilities, then mm -hmm. they themselves will need to show, provide evidence that they are proficient at this level, you know, and uh, you might want to adopt or adapt CFR very soon. And uh, I think the link to initiate this. I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank so you. before before the uh, students can graduate from teacher training institutions, for example, they need to show evidence that their level is maybe B2 or maybe C1. This is not a novel idea. This is not a new idea. Uh, other countries in the, in the region have already adopted that. Uh, yeah. Hong Kong, for example, Hong Kong is part of China, uh, has, you know, taken, has, has, you know, made this policy, you know, 
uh, it started many years ago. You know, if you want to become an English teacher, teaching in a, in a public school, you have to show additional evidence. You need to take a test actually. And this is a government uh, produced test. You need to take that test in order to show that you are capable, that you are competent uh, in terms of English language proficiency and also in terms of your ability to teach using that language in the classroom. More or less roughly is about IELTS 7, which is C1. So if, if your level is below C1, then you can't teach, you are not allowed to teach in, in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you all presenters. So I'm afraid um, we are running out of, out of time. So this is the last question. Uh, Dr. Jamie Dunley, you may want to answer this. Um, this question is about resistance. So um, if Indonesia to be uh, to uh, if Indonesia is going to establish our own national framework, how can compliance to such framework be improved or enforced countrywide at the individual level? So maybe you want to share based on your experience working with governments in several countries, Jamie? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm always very suspicious about enforcing things on an individual level. Um, but so I think I think the lessons we've learned. And so before I joined the British Council, I spent 20 years in Japan, first as a teacher and then at a national lang language testing agency. And, and we aligned, we were the first to align the largest DFL test in Japan to the CFR. What we saw in Japan was that it was very much bottom up. We adopted it uh, or adapted, as I should say, because we saw it as a useful thing that we didn't have in the past, a common tool. And also, at that point, we were, we were looking internationally and we needed something we could discuss our system with people overseas with, and it provided us with that framework. When it was created in Europe, what you saw initially, originally, was that it was very much teacher up. It was created by a very collaborative group of cross-working partners. And those people really were the enthusiastic flag bearers of the CFR in there, and they and still are. Then you saw situations where policymakers saw the CFR as a very easy win. And they said, OK, we're going to impose the CFR from top down. We're just going to tell you that you need to do this. And that's where it's received the most resistance. So what I think we need to do is find a happy balance between the two. Um, it needs to be a policy, I think, as Jocko said, I think without that sort of policy, you know, authority, then it won't have any resources. And without resources, you can't do anything. At the right. same time, people need to own it. And that's where I think the adapting principle that, uh, that Cecilia mentioned, I think, works. Because to adapt it, you need to follow a lot of the steps that were carried out in developing the CFR or the CFRJ, which is an excellent example of how that's been done as well. Collaboratively, you need to engage with the educators. So they learn about it as you adapt it. So you, you need buy-in, people need to feel they have some control over it, but it does need policy authority. So once again, it's about not doing one or the other, it's about getting a, a balance of the two approaches. Because people need to police themselves, if you like. So people would buy into the system rather than being forced to. Okay, thank you, Dr. Denley. So um, I apologize because we cannot answer all your questions. Um, I'm afraid this is the end of our Q&A session. Thank you very much for the insight shared by the three presenters. And I would like to invite all three presenters to deliver their concluding remarks. Um, we can start first from Miss Cecilia and then followed by Pat Willy and uh, Dr. Dunley. Okay, well, knowing the current situation in Indonesia, uh, that we don't have any established standards, it is our responsibility to work together in establishing the standard. Thank you. Mm. Yes, uh, two. Two things we can do. Number one, wait until the government introduces a policy. And that is going to take forever, uh, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years down the road. The second approach is for you to start small. Start with you. Start with you because CFR is about using language, is about knowing how to use language for 
talking, for reading, for writing, and so on. Uh, assessment should also be done in the same way. So try to familiarize yourself, familiarize yourself with the system, with the framework, and then try to sort of use some of the ideas for teaching purposes. Now, eventually, there should be a good match between what you do in terms of teaching and what uh, you'll be assessing uh, your students so that there is a happy marriage between uh, the two. And that often requires, you know, uh, quite a bit of change in terms of how you teach and how you design your lesson and how you uh, prepare your students for the uh, assessment. Yes. Oh, yes, you, Jamie. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I think one thing I'd like people to take away is that comprehensive learning system triangle that I, I showed at the beginning. Because the standards need to be part of that system. And it's about curriculum, it's about the classroom, and it's about assessment. And that system can be at a national level, but it's equally important at a school level. All parts of the system need to be tied up. And it could be equally important at an individual level. As a teacher, you need to know what the curriculum is. You need to think about what the standards are. Uh, you need to be thinking about how you implement them in your classroom and what kind of assessment is appropriate. So I think thinking about things as a system, not just about the standards, the classroom, the curriculum or assessment, but about putting them all together. Um, and the other two key words are be flexible and be patient. It, it takes time. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's another lesson we've learned from around the world. Okay, thank you. And um, Mr. Colm Downs, um, do you have anything to add? A parting Thank you very much. Shot. Um, I'd just like maybe to end with some comments. I know that the our participants are very patiently waiting for the end of the webinar and the link so that you can get your certificate and the materials. So thank you for staying with us. It's been a very rich discussion this afternoon uh, from our expert speakers. I think it's clear that whether the CEFR is adapted or adopted, that Indonesian teachers and the Ministry of Education need to bring in standards um, and clear objectives for, for students to work towards. Students need to know, um, you know clearly what their current level of English is at the moment and what they need to do to improve that level of English um, to make progress. You know, what, it, what, it, what English uh, proficiency level will they need to get into university and then maybe to get a scholarship to go and study overseas. I think there's space, as Jamie was talking about, to have both global tests for certain groups and locally produced uh, tests and assessment for different parts of Indonesia. I know that in this webinar we have had the insight um, from our experts. I wanted to say that next week um, I'm very excited that we will be having another webinar, which will be more of a workshop and it will be an opportunity for you to learn some practical techniques of how to measure your students level of English using the CEFR. So, you know, come back next Thursday and join us uh, to gain some practical ideas uh, to implement in the classroom. Um, you know, and for me, um, I look forward to the rest of this webinar series and uh, engaging with you and I'll be looking at all of your questions and, uh, and, and look forward to, to sort of being with you on this journey throughout this month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all presenters. So um, um, I would like to invite all presenters and Professor Joko Nurkamto and Mr. Kong Downs to turn your camera on. So we're going to have a uh, a, uh, a, a photo. Um, so yeah, wait two seconds. Okay, nice. Thank you. Um, so before we end the session, I have an important announcement to make. So we're going to share with you the slides.
Okay. So um, the first one is about English score. So this is a free mobile English test from the British Council. Uh, individuals can take English scores, but uh, you know, recently English score B2B platform was launched and the platform will give organization access to the test results of their students and staff. So English score can assess proficiency in four skills, grammar, vocabulary, reading, and listening in under 40 minutes. And test takers will get, uh, will get overall CFR score ranging from A2 to C1. And in addition to that, they will also get a percentage score and CFR score for each, uh, for each skill. So uh, I would like to encourage all attendees to take, to take English score and use the code provided as shown on the screen, B-R-T-S-F-B-H-Y. So by using this code, you agree to share your test score with the British Council Indonesia. We won't use your data and test score for any commercial purposes. Uh, do not worry about that. But what we're going to do is we will encourage attendees from the first session until the third sessions to take uh, English score. And we will share the test result statistic of people joining the symposium and taking the test just before the end of the fourth session. So it will be interesting you know, to find out the test result statistic of the participants who uh, mainly are teachers and educators. Okay, and the next event we'll have is the eight new directions in English language assessment conference. This is the British Council's annual language testing and assessment conference. So the conference provides perspective and insight on trends and approaches in English language assessment at a local, regional, and international level. So this year, for the first time, uh, we will conduct the conference online on the 30th and the 31st of October. Uh, but the pre-conference event will take place throughout October. And also for the first time this year, representatives from countries in Southeast and Northeast Asia are given slots to share insights and learning points from their countries. And for Indonesia, the session will be delivered by Professor Joko Nurkamto on the 30th of October at 2.20 p.m. Singapore time or 1.20 p.m. Jakarta time. So Professor Joko Nurkamto will be sharing about the need to have a standardized English test to measure the English proficiency level of the graduates from the English studies program. So make sure you sign up for the uh, New Direction Conference. And the next event we will have is the World Teachers Day 2020 web conference. This is an event uh, organized by the British Council and IATEVL. The conference will take place online on October 3rd. And the theme for this year is Teachers Leading in Crisis, Reimagining the Future. So as you know that 2020 has been a challenging year for schools and teachers um, who have had to adjust to new ways of working. So this conference will benefit educators around the world. And also as mentioned by Jamie, we are, we are, we are going to have uh, how language assessment works uh, workshops. So this MOOC will start from the November 16th. So you can see the link there to register. Um, and the, uh, the project, the works project will provide uh, information, materials, and training for anyone who is interested in learning more about language assessment. And the last slide is about the survey link. Yeah, so this is the link to access the survey. And I would like to remind you again, you have to complete this survey and then you can get uh, the link to download um, your e-certificate and also presenters materials. And please remember this link will be available 
only until 7 p.m. today. So that's the end of our uh, first sessions of the National Symposium on English Language Assessment. So uh, I will see you again in the second session next week, same day, same time. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah.